Dude, that maybe that's what I need to be a genius. I just need to develop my alcohol addiction again. Like just let it flare right up, but just drink out of beakers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not I'm not an alcoholic. I'm a scientist. You don't yeah, know. Exactly. Yeah. This is uh can't you see the the vessel in which my this alcohol is, a, is kept? This doc, is science. <laughs> Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Bill. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's riffing. That's that to me is riffing. I had not thought of that reference, and then it occurred to me. That's fun stuff. Welcome to the Mr. Bill Podcast. I'm Anand Harsh, editor in chief of theunce.com, Bill's manager and COVID survivor. I think. Uh, TBD, actually. Sorry, this episode is late. That's on me for finally getting the bug after two years. I'm never leaving my house again. Today's guest is Mux Mool. You know how sometimes you'll be at a party and across the room you'll see two of your exes talking to each other and you're like, I wonder if they're talking about me. Turns out my paranoia was well-founded. Mux Mool first rose to prominence during the early Adult Swim era thanks to his bump music, which he spun into an entire career via Ghostly International, as well as some other labels releasing albums such as Skull Taste and Planet High School. He was making lo-fi hip-hop to study and relax too long before it was cool. And he's very cool. Also used to do a drunken live stream show with me on the internet before we got sober and before we could get canceled for our bad takes on everything. Also a former housemate like Bill, so of course they're going to talk about how good of a chef I am. Anyway, Brian is one of my favorite people on the planet. Planet High School, still the best album name ever. No contest. Speaking of lo-fi hip-hop, today's episode is brought to you by Artiphone. The they made a handheld mini looping MIDI controller and sequencer that's about the size of like half an orange. Their bestseller Orba responds to natural gestures like tapping and tilting, and its touch sensitive pads capture even the most subtle micro movements. You can idea dump your next beat on the go. It's got a built in speaker and a eighth inch headphone jack if you don't want to broadcast your juvenile creations. Use it with any DAW like Logic or Ableton and take full advantage of its incredible MPE capabilities. The best part is it's under 100 bucks. So Bill said I had to make a beat with it for the opening and frankly, it's been a ton of fun as I've been laying in bed with the Rona. Here's uh, something I made in four minutes and uh, I can play on top of it too. This is an audio medium, but you should go check it out at Instagram.com slash Artiphone. That's A-R-T-I-P-H-O-N. You can plug in the Orba to a tablet or computer to change the sounds, export videos, do all sorts of things. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. We've been playing around with it a lot here at the house. Use code Mr. Bill's Tunes for 10% off your Orba. If even a dummy like me can use it, you're going to be great. Everything is on the website, tutorial, sample packs, tour dates, and this podcast. Go to live.mrbillstunes.com for absolutely everything Mr. Bill. And thank you to everyone who has supported the debut Kill Bill EP. It's kind of going nuts right now, and we're super, super excited about the response and reaction to it. The tour is off to a crazy good start. Three shows at or near capacity in Indianapolis, Portland, and Seattle. Um, they're going to be in Manchester, New Hampshire on Friday, April 29th, and San Diego on May 5th, and Washington, D.C. on June 1st. Bill's doing solo sets at Disco Pussy in Vegas on May 3rd, and Soundwell in Salt Lake City on May 7th. Both of those shows are with Ben and Canty of Zebler and Canty Experience. Then Sunday, May 8th, he's headlining Soul Fest in Florida. Bigfoot Electro is on Memorial Day weekend in Tennessee, and Tribal Connection is in Ohio on June 3rd. More Kill Bill and solo Mr. Bill dates are coming soon. Tickets at Linktree slash Mr. Bill's Tunes. Okay, that was a lot of stuff. Enjoy Bill's chat with my good friend Brian Lindgren, a.k.a. Mux Mool. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you are listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're 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 listening to the 
Yeah, there we go. All right, cool. Should be good. What up, Bill? <laughs> Not too much, man. Yeah, thanks for being flexible. I uh, have had like really shitty sleep lately. Um, I think I've just been like stressed in weird ways and shit. So like I will stay up for like two or three days and then sleep for like multiple days. And yeah, my shit is all over the place huh. right now. It's, it's weird. But hey, you know, this is the time for weird stress. I mean, it's just been the age of weird stress, has it not? It has. Have you heard of the new BA2 coronavirus variant? No, I haven't. That's great. I'm glad I'm yeah. hearing I'm glad I'm hearing it from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cuz uh, you know, at least I'll tell it to you with a smile on my face, not like CNN. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> they'll they'll grimace at you while they tell you this information. But uh yeah, basically it's uh more more uh catchy than Omicron. Uh, or Omicron, however you want to say that. And it is uh, also worse for you. Oh, than Omicron. fantastic. Yeah. You know, I, I got vaccinated. I stayed safe for a long time. And then I had a show back in November. And the, the mandates here were lifted. And it was so awesome to be in like a packed crowd again. And I had to pass through that crowd to grab like my merch and then leave. And I got so sick after that. And I never got tested for Corona, but I, I mean, it seems pretty clear that I got it and it was rough. Damn. What were your uh, symptoms? <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, very flu like, of course I had a crazy fever, um, and then just like full body aches. And then eventually it turned into a cough and it was a really terrible cough. Like it was you know, the kind of <laughs> pathetic wheezing that I haven't done since I was like a kid. And, you know, I went to public school, <laughs> you know, like that kind of sick. But uh, it was it wasn't until I was like I went to the fridge and I grabbed something and I, I like had yogurt and I tasted it. I was like, well, maybe I can't taste it because it's yogurt. It doesn't have that much flavor. Right. So I started eating other things. I was like, nope, it's gone. No, uh, <laughs> it was terrible. But <clears throat> but Jesus. I lived. That's crazy. And like. How pungent of a thing did you eat and couldn't taste? So the thing that I ate to test it is, if, have you ever had garlic? It's uh, like garlic cloves that they just leave in honey. and it's No, but I've, I've had like garlic cloves that just come in the bag already peeled. Yeah, so <laughs> if you take garlic and you put it into honey uh, and just soak it for like a month... Uh, it sort of makes the the honey a little more liquidy and the, it like, you know, they just sort of fuse together and it creates this very crazy third flavor. But it's supposed to be good for uh, illnesses and stuff. So I was like, I'll give this a shot. And I couldn't even taste that. So Damn, that seems like it would be quite potent of a taste. Yeah, it's still, it's still raw garlic. So I should have been able to taste it. So what's going on there? Honey has sugar. Garlic has... Definitely not yeast. Um, yeah, well, I wonder what's going on there. Because if yeah. the honey's getting more liquidy, that means seems that seems to me like some sort of fermentation. Yeah, I guess. Hmm. I don't know because we got it at a like a farmer's market. This guy was talking it up and saying how great it was, and we also got some pickles from him, which were really good. And so, I uh, just you know, I was like, why not? You know, if to support a farmer. And then I ate it. It was. I mean, it's. It's a pretty, it, it tastes like garlic. It tastes like honey, but it tastes like something else also that I'd never tasted before. So if you ever see it, yeah. give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I will if I ever see him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah if, you're ever, if you're ever at the Denver <laughs> Farmer's Market, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so I, the other day, <clears throat> um, this was when I was living in San Francisco still, so I was in like December. I was uh, laying, or I was, I'd just been the same deal as now. I was stressed and I'd been up for a few days and it's not, you know, treating my health the best. And then one day, <clears throat> like my arm started going numb, my left arm. Oh no. And I started started getting like a jaw pain uh, <clears throat> and I, I was short on breath and my heart, like, oh, sorry, my chest was like extremely tight. Um, and I was like, oh my God, I'm like having a heart attack for sure. Oh no. And and I was like, fuck, I don't want to have a heart attack. That's like bad. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so I, was, I literally just like was laying like completely flat and like sprawled out on my uh, floor and just like trying to breathe really slowly, um, trying to calm myself down because I was like, maybe this is anxiety. Yeah. Uh, and after a while, I was like, all right, it doesn't seem like it's anxiety. It seems like it's actual like heart problems. So I was like, well, maybe I'll just sleep it off. So I uh, got in bed and fell asleep. This was like 4 p.m. or something like that. And then I got up at 9 a.m. the next day and I was supposed to go mountain biking with a friend at Mount Sutro. Man, you so sound like, fun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to you know, go try and do it to see if my heart can handle that. Um, and sort of somewhat luckily, my friend didn't rock up. He like slept in and... Uh, so I was like, oh, I'll just do the ride by myself. I literally made it like not even 10 minutes and I was like, fucked, had no energy at all. Couldn't breathe properly and shit. So I was like, fuck this. I'm just going to ride home. So I just rode home. Um, this was uh, like 11 a.m. the next day. And I was like, oh man, I should probably just like, if it's still like this by the afternoon, like 4 p.m. or something. I'll, Maybe I'll, go like, see go somebody. The, yeah, I'll like yeah. go to the emergency room, right? So I got to the 4 p.m., my heart, my, like my chest was still really tight. Arms were numb. Jaw was like all painful, tight, like short on breath, all of that shit. So I went to the ER. <clears throat> I was like, I think I'm having a heart attack. And they're like, all right. So they gave me an EKG. And they're like, your heart's fine. It looks totally fine. Uh, <clears throat> or like the, the EKG thing looks fine. They're like, let us give you a lung x-ray, you know, because like maybe it's pneumonia. Maybe it's like, maybe your heart is like uh, inflamed uh, and that could be causing some issues. They were like, no, uh, after giving me a lung x-ray, they were like, uh, your heart looks like the correct size. Like it's not inflamed or anything. And you don't have like any, there's no weird shit in your lungs or anything. Then they're like, let us check your, uh, like your, blood so they took a bunch of blood like fuck 10 vials or something and um <clears throat> uh tested all of that and then they came back and were like that looks fine too and then they gave me a covid test and they were like oh you have covid <laughs> and they're like so and they think all of that came from covid yeah they think it was covid and just anxiety on top of that jeez that's intense yeah, yeah, so I, I literally, like, my my symptoms were just, yeah, chest tightness, arm numb, like, literally heart attack symptoms. And um, I just read an article online that was written by, uh, let me actually check because I don't want to be one of those podcasts. Yeah, no, now it's not the time. Mis- yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just, like, you know, say that I'm not a doctor straight up. <laughs> um, you're not a doctor, you're a mister. Yeah, I'm a mister, yeah. Yeah. And I'm an MR, not a DR. Yeah. Uh, let's see. All right, so <clears throat> this is not me saying this. This is the website arstechnica.com from a person named Beth Mole. So if you have any issues with any of this, take it up with Beth. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway, Beth um, Mole, no relation to Mux Mole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's not, I got nothing to do with that. Take it up with Mux's mum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, it says uh, COVID causes substantial long-term cardiovascular risks, huge study finds. Okay. That's the headline. And then the, there's a bunch more writing under that that I am not going to read on the podcast, but right. uh, if people want to read it, <clears throat> if you want to read it even, I'll uh, you know, post it in yeah, the chat. Yeah, send a link, and, yeah. But yeah, anyway, so apparently it is actually bad for your heart. So, so it's quite possible that it, that it did heart damage. Who knows? But anyway, there's a worse one coming. Um, yeah, looking forward <laughs> to it. And it's easier to get than Omicron. Oh, gosh. Well, you know, it, after – I was always very safe about it. And I had had a job for a, uh, the first, like, maybe eight months working at a grocery store – and, you know, was always very safe and it made sense to stay safe and stay masked up. And I didn't complain. And uh, Wait, that seems unsafe. Uh, well, I mean, I had to keep the job like I couldn't quit the job. Right. But like I just, yeah. you know, while I was there, I didn't, you know, I didn't uh, uh, I didn't mess around with it. Um, and I was glad that I got sick after being vaccinated because I've read some of the um, for people who lost their sense of smell and taste. Some people it never came back. Oh, that's and, fucked. Yeah, and some people, uh, when their sense of taste and smell came back, um, everything you know tastes like rotten eggs, right. things like that, like stuff that I wouldn't have wanted to deal with. So I'm really glad. But 
uh, after after I caught it, even though the max mask mandates are you know light again now here in Denver, uh, I still I'm still masking up. I'm not interested in going through that again in any way. I'm still totally. keeping distance. I'm still you know uh, uh, trying to make sure that my immunity is as good as possible in in other ways. So yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, same here. I mean, me Anand and I don't leave the house without N95s. Yeah. Um, because I mean, why why risk it? It's like yeah. You, why risk reinfection? Why risk if you have it like potentially giving it to someone else? It's like, yeah. just fucking put a mask on. Yeah. But anyway, it's not that uncomfortable. It's like at the start of the pandemic, I was like, oh, this kind of sucks. I can feel yeah. like my breath on my cheeks and nose and shit. And yeah, my it's not, glasses it's, are... it's not great. I wouldn't choose it for fashion. It's just, right. <laughs> it just isn't that uncomfortable, uh, you know, that yeah, I wouldn't want to do it. So yeah, it's fine. Uh, so one thing I have thought about, um, I'm also glad I didn't lose my taste, but if I did, I have a feeling that it would actually improve my diet because then I would just be like, it doesn't matter what I eat. It all tastes the same. Maybe it's texturally different, but like I might as well just eat like fucking straight protein and straight calcium and shit. Like, yeah, it right. You might be able to, well, you know, but I think it also might take away, you know, cause I do a lot more, uh, cooking these days than I used to. And mm tasting being able to you would not be able to uh uh ascertain chemically like what you're eating uh, you would which, be a fucking horrible cook yeah you'd be a terrible cook and you wouldn't like yeah, if, the, you, if the chicken was you may, spoiled you wouldn't you might not even know right yeah, yeah. oh yeah if you didn't have your smell or taste right. yeah you could be cooking shit that just tastes like straight like carcinogenic shit and, like, <laughs> yeah i mean you, you could give be it eating to your family. fiberglass yeah, yeah yeah right right um, yeah, I think what I would probably do in that case is I would just eat like cans of chickpeas and, you know, uh, lots of edamame beans and shit and like stuff like that. that yeah. Stuff that like I don't mind the taste of now, but I wouldn't even bother cooking them at that point. I would just eat fucking raw, raw everything. Well, this, you know, one of the other strange things was like because uh, I have never lost my sense of taste or smell before. And what was funny is that, I st- you know, I, of course, I still ate. But when I was eating, there was this expectation of flavor. Like, I know what the thing I'm eating tastes like, but it's not actually coming to me. But I'm, like, imagining, like, am I tasting it or not? And ever since then, also, whenever I taste something, or often when I taste stuff, I, I like, question it. I'm, like, is this what tasting is? Is this what I'm doing? Like, <laughs> you know, it's just, I've never had to go through that before, but it's been funny. And, uh, yeah, but I can taste again, and I can, you know, smell this is almost like phantom limb syndrome, right? Like when somebody that's, yeah, uh, that's kind of what it, that's kind of what it felt like because it was like you know all the other cues of like eating ice cream and like vanilla ice cream. Like you you can imagine what that is right now. How it that you know all of those things and the only thing that's gone is just the vanilla like flavor, but you still know it's vanilla. So it's yeah, phantom limb man, phantom tongue, phantom nose. Huh. So what were you eating when when you couldn't taste anything? Um. So my appetite didn't change. Like I was still, well, I mean, I, when I was very, very sick, I, I couldn't eat at all. Um, and so I was like, uh, I, I had a, I had a bag of candy from, uh, my girlfriend's, uh, stepmom that she sent home over Thanksgiving. And I just remember eating that, but like, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think like what some of the wilder things, like eating a cheeseburger, like, you know, during that, that was, that was pretty strange. Mm. You know, normally. Yeah, like why would why would you even bother if you can't taste? Um, because you know the craving is still there. Like what what your body mm. wants. You know, you still know. Uh this would be like if you were a heroin addict and you started taking like a something that blocks the effects of the opiates, but you ah, would still be like, oh, still, I want to mm-hmm. do. Her. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Although I guess food is. Well, actually, I'm not sure about this statement I was about to make. I was about to say food's less addictive than heroin, but I don't think that about sugar, maybe. Yeah, that's true. And actually, one of the things, you know, uh, uh, about addiction and when I, you know, because I've, I've done my own um, journeys with addiction. And one of the things that I learned about was for people who are addicted to food, um, one of the hardest things is you cannot abstain from food forever. You can't quit food. You're going to have to keep eating and you're going to have to find a healthy balance, which is not something that they 
could recommend for anybody addicted to right. drugs. They can't be like, oh, you know, you're going to have to work it out and, you know, f- uh, uh, fix your relationship with heroin so that you can do it normally. Like you right. just <laughs> it's like you quit, but you can't do that with food. And I always thought that was uh, <laughs> that seemed very challenging, you know. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've always um, I've battled with addiction for a long time. Uh, it's actually why I ended up in Charlottesville kind of, mm. but uh yeah, totally understand. Like I, I'm, I'm an addict, like at the core. So I'm addicted to kind of everything. Mm-hmm. But um, food, food is one of them, and that's why I was like overweight for a long time, uh, and still am, actually. I would say, but yeah, it's a <clears throat> extremely hard thing to to balance food. You're right, because it's yeah. something you can't stop. Yes, and, and you, yeah, yeah. So you, yeah, you're right. You have to just like build better habits with it, and like build a better relationship with it, and all that kind of stuff. It's yeah, really tough. And, you know, they also, you know, uh, I, I, uh, someone in my family has a gambling addiction, which was always fascinating to me because I, I find gambling to be pretty boring. I'll go to a casino. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I'll drink the free soda. I love all the lights and everything or whatever. Um, but just, you know, there's behavioral ones too, where I'm like, how can you get addicted to that? But, you know, it's, it's just, it's, uh, something, uh, that it gives your brain dopamine, you know, food will do that. Uh, um, you know. There's there's all kinds of dangers out there, and you really do have to, you know, try and balance it. Right. Um, how comfortable are you talking about your addiction and what oh, you're addicted to? Absolutely comfortable. Ask ask away. <clears throat> oh well, what substance were you addicted to? So, um, uh, in my in my younger years, I had uh, uh, I was addicted to, or you know, had a troubling relationship with alcohol. Um, a lot of you know blow ups and things like that, but actually. When I got sober in uh, 2007, um, that's when actually my career really took off. Was after that um, because Funny I started. Yeah, that works. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? Um, well, I finally started taking myself seriously and just saying like I can do this and I want to, and you know I, I wasn't routinely having like breakdowns and stuff like that and confusion, confusion and stuff, and um, you know I did some AA stuff that taught me communication skills and interpersonal skills that I never really had, such as, you know, like why to tell people the truth and tell them right away and things like that, where it was really started improving my life, you know, to be able to say to people, I don't want to hang out with you or, um, I can't, I can't do that. And, you know, some boundaries. So that was all very helpful. Um, and then later on it became, uh, Adderall because of course, uh, I, you know, I still suffer from ADHD, uh, issues and Adderall uh, solves some of them, but it causes a lot more of other problems. And so that that became a thing for quite a while, especially while touring. Like you know, I would say, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, it's great for touring if if you don't have long in a hotel and you know you got to be at the airport early in the morning, just stay up. You know, <laughs> um, like who needs sleep? Yeah, right. It's not, and, it's not like uh, staying awake is just doing low level brain damage to you constantly or anything yes, like that. Yeah. Just push right. through. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but also your brain is firing. So you don't you don't feel the fatigue or whatever. But, um, you know, and that was that has been, you know, I mean, I'm 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 sober now, I've been sober for a while now, but it was it was, you know, throughout uh, a few years where it just. You know, you have symptoms, you have frustrations. You're like, why can't I, you know, do this? Or like, you know, getting frustrated when you when I turn on a video game and I don't, I play for maybe six minutes and then I quit. Or right. open up a session, you know, do it for a little bit and quit. And it's not about sitting down and doing everything all at once. It's just about uh, trying to uh, uh, remain consistent for, you know, like just try again. Cons- just like consistently start things and quit. Uh, you know, yeah, and, and don't be afraid to go back to it. You know, it, it, it um, try and be. I'm trying to think of the word, uh, uh, but you don't persistent. You, uh, yeah, you want to you want to try and structure yourself. You know, to do that, and also one of the other great things is exercise. Oh man, exercise will help you. <laughs> yep. If, 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 you, if you're not depressed and you get up and you go like exercise, take a walk. You know, those things are really helpful too. Yeah, it's totally true. It's funny, man, because like this shit that I know makes me feel bad reliably. I mean, like every time I do it, it'll make me feel bad, like eating fucking chocolate or something or eating like too much ice cream. Like I know 100% with uh, like without a doubt 
after it, I'm going to feel worse than I did before it. Yeah. Uh, and I know also with a, almost 100% reliability that every time I do exercise, I'm going to feel better after it. Yep. But for some reason, there's this like fucking dumb oh, ass man. dissonance in my mind that's like, I don't want to do this thing that I know reliably makes me feel better all the time. And I totally want to do this thing that I know reliably makes me feel bad all the time. Right. Yeah, that, that can be a struggle too. And it's, what's funny is I, uh, I also ride a bike and I... I love the the feeling, uh, you know, kind of, it feels a little bit like flying and I have a nice bike. And so I resist exercising with it sometimes. And then every time I get out there and I start biking, I'm like, this is, this is fun. And this is as easy as exercise could ever get. Right. You know, I'm just Do you mountain bike or no, it's, it's a, it's a street bike, single speed. So a fixie. No, no, one. not fixed gear, just single speed. It's still yeah. coasts oh, and stuff. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, does your cat not have a tail? Yeah, Mo. Uh, Mo is, uh, he is a um, flame point Siamese Manx, so he has no tail naturally. What? Yeah. Hold on, I gotta Google this cat. Flame yeah. point Siamese Minx. Manx, M-A-N-X. M-A-N-X. All right, let's see. He's behind me right now. I'll see if he can come in here. Yeah, he, I just noticed when he was climbing up, I was like, that looks like a very round butt. Yeah. With no yeah. tail. He was born with <laughs> no tail. He's just like a little fucking scud rocket or something. Well, he also he also has a little um there's a there is a little nub there that I can't see because it's under hair, but when you pet him, sometimes it'll move a little bit. It's pretty cute. <laughs> That's sick. Yeah. It's like that um that meme where it shows the cat like moving and then it like goes to Shaquille O'Neal or whatever doing the same thing. Yes, yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> awesome. Um yeah, man. So uh, we said we we're going to talk about living with Anand because you oh, also yeah, lived with yeah. Anand. And people on the podcast are pretty familiar with him at this point because he introduces every episode. Oh, does he? Um, okay. Yeah, so so people know Anand. We, we, we've done a few episodes before. I think people like Anand. He's a pretty likable dude, I He's think. He's a very likable guy. Yep. Yeah. And uh, he's also a fucking crazy cook. I had no idea. Like, yes, literally, yes. I, I've known the dude for like fucking a decade almost. And like... And then I rock up here and he's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a gourmet chef. It's like, what? <laughs> Did he say he's a gourmet chef or just? <laughs> no, I said that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. But I, he is, dude. I mean, like the stuff he was cooking for me, I was like, this looks like shit I would get in a restaurant and it tastes like shit I would like. It's so good. Yes. And uh, I had some meals with him and, you know, uh, it, when I lived with him, gosh, what year? I don't know what year that was. I think it was maybe 2015. I was... I had had a good living situation with someone and then uh, uh, his girlfriend moved in. So I had to move out and I was, you know, the Denver housing market wasn't easy then. It's not easy now. Um, and so I just was bouncing around and then eventually found myself there for a while. And it was great. It was really nice of him to open up his house to me, you know, mm. uh, yeah, owe, yeah. owe him forever for that. <laughs> Anon told me that, uh, He's like, oh, yeah, you'll have a good conversation with Mux. He's like, when me and Mux get together, though, it's like almost uh, like who can out joke each other. <laughs> Dude, I love riffing. Yes, there were many late <laughs> nights of sitting there riffing. I love doing that. Even though, I, you know, I'm not I'm not like not always trying to be funny, but I love the riffing, especially with puns. Just like just like saying random crap, basically. Yes, I do that. I do that with a few other artists like uh, uh, Elliot Lip, too. I love riffing with him. Yeah, <laughs> so. Nice. Riffin. It's a good word for it. Yeah. I've actually heard that um, said to me before uh, when I was hanging around with um, my buddy Michael Zaman and he was just like saying a bunch of random crap and then I would just like start responding with also just like very random stuff. Yeah. And he was like, oh yeah, man, this is sick. We're riffing. I was like, <laughs> never heard that before, but all right. yeah. Well, like you know, riffing to me means like making shit on a guitar. Right. Playing and, power okay. chords and shit. So like, yeah, like a riff, a guitar riff in that sense, you know, it's just like this really, it, it, a riff in the guitar sense, I guess, is just what good conflict resolution with writing a melody or whatever, a question <laughs> and an answer or whatever. And I guess if you riff uh, back and forth musically with people, you know, it becomes a conversation where you're like, you're suggesting something and then someone else is resolving it. That it can be really fun. And if you can do that properly with comedy or puns or, or you know, whatever, um, that also becomes a fun other level conversation where you can tell the person understands the kind of humor that you're going for 
you know, uh, I, I do like communicating that way. I don't get to do it mm. that often. Um, I've, actually, have you heard of the the uh, Endless app? Oh, it's the one that Tim Exile made, right? Yes. I yeah. uh, uh, A friend of mine uh, suggested it to me, and I downloaded it. I didn't do much with it, um, but then I started getting more into it, and that's all it is. You're just, you know, you can just co- you just endlessly add parts um, or take them out or whatever with other people, and the integration is pretty good. And it's I've found that to be a pretty fun exercise in in exactly that because you can't you're is not it, sorry finish uh, it, because you know you there is a chat part portion of it, um, but you just hear what someone throws on and then you just kind of write to that and then you know back and forth or however many people are in there and it really is a fun exercise. So, is it just on iOS or is it on computer? They have it. They have it on uh, computer now too. Uh, with uh, you can write parts in Ableton and just you know put the loops like, right in there. Right so in. yeah. Dude, that's so cool. Yeah, let's do that sometime. Cause yeah, I've, I'd love I've, to uh, have you. Yeah, man. I uh, downloaded it when it first came out. Um, I got like some beta email from Tim and he was like, check this thing out, beta people. And I was like, I didn't, I don't know how you have my email even. But <laughs> yeah. I'm like a big fan of his stuff. So I wasn't yeah. like mad or anything. But yeah, I, I downloaded it. And I think because I got it in like the beta phase, maybe it wasn't like, completely ready or something and then i it was only until recently right where he released like the actual releasable version to the public or something yeah it's it's it feels Is new endless endless dot endless FM. endless with three s's right and then it's yeah. like a dot fm address correct I don't. Yes, I think so. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Tim Exile is crazy. Like he's for the longest time just been so forward thinking. Like he's one uh, of those yeah. Richard Divine kind of people. Yes, he like, is. You know, it's funny because I, you know, I had. Uh, uh, I'm a fan of his too, and I got to play with him at Sauna Tech in Chicago like a million years ago, and he did the show with a joystick. Or a portion oh, wow. of it with a joystick. <laughs> where, I don't know if it was just like X, Y controls or what he was, you know, but I was just like, you know, I'm like just starting to play the M audio trigger finger and this motherfucker's coming with a joystick. And yeah, <laughs> it was, it was really, it was really cool. You know, one of those, one of those performances that I don't often see in electronic music where there's a bit of magic involved in me going, how is that happening? You yeah, know, I mean, like that's beyond me. Yeah, dude. It, I, so, Every now and then, like a fan will hit me up, right? And they'll be like, dude, you're a genius or whatever. And I'm like, no, I'm really not. And like, I, I actually, um, I was like, maybe I am by the definition of the term. And I went and Googled it and I'm not. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he called you a genius and you Googled it? Man, that's genius I was like, level. I'll- I was like, yeah, what does it take for someone to be a genius, right? And um, here's, here's the definition. A genius is a person who displays exceptional intellectual ability, creative productivity, universality in genres or originality, typically to a degree that is associated with the achievement of new discoveries or advances in a domain of knowledge. So like Tim Exile is that, Richard Devine is that, like these people like who are designing the software that people like me use are right. that. So, but so- I'm not making any new discoveries, man. Like this dude's coming in with with shit like that and he made like the mouth and the finger for reactor and like he's making like a crazy tools like this endless thing They're like that's a genius you know you know and i really appreciate that kind of stuff because i i feel like what i you know uh, uh it's interesting that you're talking about you know not feeling like a genius but i could understand why people would think that because i've watched you know some of your uh, um you know production streams and it goes by so quickly and it's sort of that uh, how you work is proof of one concept that I've always felt. And that's like, you don't always get better. It's more so that you get faster. Like when the more and more you practice stuff, you arrive at certain points much quicker. And, you know, when you're copying and pasting and you can hear all your keyboards and stuff going, you know, I think that is really uh, overwhelming or, or not overwhelming. That is really impressive to people. It's sort of like magic, you know, like they, right, right. you know, but to you, of course, you're just doing what you've been doing, what you did slowly at one point, really, really quickly. And, you know, uh, uh, using the tools within the thing that you have. And I feel the same. I don't feel like innovating in the world of computer technology. I love mm-hmm. Ableton. I wanted to use it, but I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not making my own effects here. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I also don't necessarily think <clears throat> making your own effects these days even makes you a genius because, like, now Max for Live exists. Like, I mean, I've made my own version of contact in Max for Live, but it's not a new discovery. Like contact right, was a new right, discovery. Right. When, but yeah, uh, 
I think like to become a genius like that, you really need to almost put music down and like start looking into science and yeah. Well, and you know, that's, yeah, I, yeah, I wouldn't want to be a genius. They seem troubled um, sometimes. And also I, there's, there's a level of science that I, um, that I don't really feel like approaching because uh, you know, especially when I'm writing music it, for me, it's, it, I try and keep it to as, as an emotional process as possible, not just fun, but you know, stopping and saying, is this a feeling? Is this how I feel? Is it reflected in this? Could someone who uh, uh, doesn't know how I feel hear this song and, uh, you know, feel what's in this? And uh, that, I mean, that's just a matter of working hard to, you know, use the software to interpret how I'm feeling as opposed to, uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying? I'm not doing science. I don't got beakers. This isn't a lab. (laughs) You know, there's plants. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I think uh, you need at least a couple of beakers. There's definitely probably at least one or two in the in the endless office. <laughs> yeah, I bet there is. Yeah, maybe full of gin or something. Yeah, dude, that maybe that's what I need to be a genius. I just need to develop my alcohol addiction again. Like, just let it flare right up, but just drink out of beakers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm a scientist. You don't yeah, know. Exactly. Yeah. This is, uh, can't you see the, the vessel in which my this alcohol a, is kept? This doc, is science. <laughs> Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Bill. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's riffing. That's, that to me is riffing. I had not thought of that nice. reference and then it occurred to me, that's fun stuff, you know? Nice. Yeah. I wanted to ask a bit about your uh, music writing process because I think I've asked about it like once before and I, and I, I want to say you told me it was like machine related to some degree or like you play stuff on like a beat pad of some sort, like an MPC or something. And uh, Yeah, I, I, um, I, I'm not very gear centric. Uh, I'm not very VST centric either. Um, I did get Ableton 10 last year and I got operator with that, which was really cool. I had never had operator for any, uh, you know, live before. I'd always had live standard, but the operator comes with some really great sounds. Um, Dude, operators the best sense. Yeah, I I had no. I guess I really didn't know, but uh, now that I have it, I I know. Um, so my <laughs> my process is usually, you know, I have a whole library of loops or you know parts and things like that, um, and I will sort of cycle through those until I stumble on something that you know feels right. You know, a, a, a percussion loop or even just a hi hat loop or something like that. And then throw that in and start that <clears throat> as like my metronome, more or less, because I hate the metronome, Ableton. Uh, yeah, I record drum sounds from you know machine uh, uh, packs, uh, and I record the audio from that uh, just so that it, to make sure that I can play the pattern. You know, I'm not programming any of my drums, um, and I think there's a, you know unquantized and stuff so i try and keep it uh, i try and instill some natural feeling that way um so you literally like every drum track on every one of your tracks is like played in not every single one but um uh, a large majority of them are or they start that way and i'll adjust them you know as needed um once i really get into like making it um and of course with dance music or anything that i'm doing that's housey uh i will quantize you know at least the the kick or something Mm. um but i do like to i you know with computer music uh uh, one of the things that it's you know always uh, trying to defend itself about is that it's you know unfeeling music it's computer music and all of this and so i (laughs) i try and put a little bit of my own flavor in there by just letting the drums be off by a little bit you know even even imperceptible amounts uh uh Mm. you know i think that um it it that can add a bit of an earwormy quality to things the same way uh, 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 the Swedish songwriters have bad phrasing for things and people, it gets <laughs> stuck in their head, you know, hit me baby one more time. That's right, not yeah, a like, proper English sentence. Or like toxic, you know. That's yeah, like right. Not to so say good. that, not to say that I'm, I'm, you know, working on Britney Spears level style drums, you know, it's, it's just, <laughs> um, but I'll record my drums that way or, you know, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's honestly, it's a lot of, um, a lot of times it's searching. I try and find, you know, uh, 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 sounds and patches and stuff that, that seem to have, you know, vibe well with each other. And I kind of start with, 
some packaged things and then I work outward from there. And that's my process now. <laughs> that wasn't always my process when or uh, early on and sometimes this still happens, but early on I um I loved digging for samples. I loved <clears> finding <throat> records with weird things on them from weird sources. Um it's like you a know, very Jay Dilla Mad Lib kind of thing. To absolutely. Do, right? Well, you know, and there was there was a there was a an ethos sort of behind the whole concept of digging, and that is that you're if you're borrowing from someone else's vision and trying to call it your own, it needs to be like an original take. It needs to sort of give power to where you're drawing from. You know, sort of bring uh, someone else's music back to the light in the proper way. And it and and if you and not stealing, that's like the number one thing. You know, if you're ripping whole sections of songs and then putting in yours and not crediting the person and not saying it's your own, uh, that's weird. Um, so for a long time, I took samples from as many, you know, genuine sources as I could. And genuine meaning like things that I actually found that I discovered that I thought were cool and I worked them into something or, uh, you know, from sources, things that mean, you know, something to me on a personal level. Um, and then sort of taking the chunks of those samples and using it to write a song around it sort of like a rhythm guitar you know like just keeping the pace keeping the chords going but everything else uh just being informed by those samples um which is uh that's always been a fun process too mm. and everything from yeah. sampling a record about how to solve the rubik's cube to you know <laughs> uh i'm trying to think furbies and like sound movie soundtracks things like that like it's, I, I used to love digging yeah, it's interesting uh, you say like the samples that you put in inform the decisions of everything else. I've always like thought that as well, but more from a sound design perspective because I'm like, essentially I do the same thing as you, but for the most part, the packs I'm digging through are from sounds that I've made. Uh, and I just have like large folders of those at this point. And uh, what I've noticed is how the sound design of the track will end up and how strong the track will end up being in sonically very much depends on the kick and the snare that I import at the start of the session. Because if I import like a weak kick and snare, then all of the sound design around it has to meet that, right? So it, so it has to, it also ends up pretty weak. But if I import like a very hard hitting kick and hard hitting snare, all of my sound design has to match that now as well. So, you know, and that's I, I've I've tried to build as strong a sample library of my own, you know, loops and stuff as I can. But what I found is that when I was uh, going back in time and listening to some of the the loops uh, that I have, they're not what I need need anymore. They're a little too janky, or I had it took me a long time because you know I didn't go to school for this. I'm assuming did you go to school for this? Yeah. Oh, okay. I did not. And so a lot of, uh, you know, I'm just learning as I go. I didn't know anything about like gain stages and stuff. So I'm playing a record really quiet off the record player and then trying to turn it up later, getting all this feedback, you know, and hissing and like learning that I don't want to have to try and make that stronger later. Let's make it strong now. And, you know, uh, uh, I don't always start with the strong kick and snare, but, um, you know, because tr you try and like layer up. Like if I got like a quiet snare that has like a little bit of tone in it and then add more later, but. Yeah, that's always doable. But I always feel like going that way about it, you're just sort of having to revisit the thing over and over again and make it because it's like you then produce a whole kind of shitty sonic, shitty, shitty track sonically. And then you're like re at the end be like, all right, time to mix it. And you reference it against like a really good track son that's, that you know hits on a system or whatever and then you're like all right fuck i have to like go basically go back and like redo start everything yeah <laughs> um i wanted to also talk about <clears throat> your uh you're saying you play things in and try to make them have like a human feel or whatever i was talking to tipper about this recently and he has a track where he just turned the grid off completely and he just imported everything by hand and just put everything in by hand but the grid was off so it was like uh, null and void thing. Like he was just putting it wherever it, it, it sounded good, right? Um, but I, I asked him about it. I was like, like, how do you, how do you feel about that? And he uh, had an interesting point, which he was he was just like, it's completely moot, like whether the grid is on or not, because like you're just gonna put it where it sounds good anyway. So it really doesn't matter if the grid if you're working to a grid or not, because you're just gonna do the same thing. Like either you're moving it off the grid. Or 
you're just moving it to where it sounds good with no grid. Right. Um, yeah. And I guess, I guess, uh, uh, to that point, like I, I get, I get stuck in some of this grid, uh, uh, um, discussion when, whenever I have to track out a song, there's like the four, you know, 16 bars, 32 bars, 64 bars, like there's formats that you can follow. And a lot of times those don't really, they don't feel right to me. And so, you know, you're just going to have a part come when you, you, when you listen to it and you go right here and then you put it there. And, but that, that also can be really time consuming because then you're listening to the song over and over and over, you know. One thing I like about Live 11 is you can turn the grid line intensity down to 0%. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah. that. It might be in Live 10 as well, actually. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's, uh, it's just a nice feature because even if you turn the grid off, there's still perforated lines uh, if right, you have the right. grid line yep. intensity up. So you kind of yeah, really want to get rid of those too, I think, if you're going to do this exercise at home. And for, and for anybody listening that doesn't know, the command for that is uh, Command 4. So that's the turn the grid on and off. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just right click. <laughs> dude, people like, they're like, dude, you're so fast at Ableton, but like you constantly are right clicking to change between like 16ths and 8ths and stuff. For some reason, I just don't use the command for that. For yeah. Whatever. And that's, that's one of the funniest things about all this too is like, you know, grid on, grid off, you know, played your drums, didn't play your drums, stole a sample, didn't steal a sample, this or that or whatever. Uh, by the time it gets to an audience's ears, if they like what they hear, that's all that matters. And there's a lot of, I mean, there's a, there's no right or wrong answers. You can use these things. I mean, I'm sure you can use max MSP to do your taxes. If you just, <laughs> you know, it, it's just because of how it, you know, these things do a lot of different things. And I always try and tell people to um, just do, just find something that works for you because the learning curve is going to be steep no matter what. And you're going to get frustrated and you're going to have to troubleshoot. Troubleshooting is such a huge issue like especially early on just yeah yeah i think the learning curve is not only steep but it's also uh like never ending yeah right you could know everything and have you ever been in somebody's like really nice studio and they know how this works and they know how that works and this is integrated to that or whatever then you hear their song and it's bullshit yes that's, yeah yeah that just is, that you is have pretty all, often yeah if you have a lot of technical knowledge it doesn't necessarily mean you make good music right and likewise, if you make good music, it doesn't mean that you can teach a class. <laughs> right. Yes. Teaching Two very is something different I've, skill sets. I have always wanted to uh, teach and share some of this, uh, some of what I know, but it's it's it is difficult when I try and show people because, like I said, I'm all self-taught. So mm. I had the program, but a lot of the times it was like putting a sound in and then putting an effect on and turning the knob, and you know, I know I know sonically how it changes it. But of course, you know, uh, mathematically, I don't know what's really changing. And there's a lot of things that I don't know what they're actually called. Like, I know you can mm -hmm. hover over on it, hover on it, and it'll sell, it'll tell you. But like, you know, the thing that is the little button that has the triangle and the three lines or whatever, and it turns, you know, like turns off automation. And so, I don't know what that's called. Like, I don't <laughs> know what the name, I just know how it works. Right. So and when it comes to uh, um, teaching, that can be tough because so much of what I've learned is just, it's just happened me and my headphones in my, in my own mind, you know, moving things around and never having to explain it with words, mm -hmm. why to do this, why not to do that. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's hard to teach. And plus I can only teach what it is that I do. You want to know how to make a Mox Mool song? I could show you how to do that. <laughs> you know, uh, if you want to make a Mr. Bill song, you may have to ask him. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think, um, in some weird way, uh, like every artist is just the gatekeeper to the shit that they do. And they're really the only person who can show you how they do what they do. Oh, yeah. Very true. Yeah. There's a lot of like how to recreate this Dead Mouse song on YouTube and stuff. But it's it's not like really how to do it. The, the way you learn how to make a Dead Mouse song is watching him on a Twitch stream. Uh, sure. And, yeah. And just... Much more insight that way. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about making hip hop beats because it's like a world that I'm not at all in. Uh, but I sort of have ventured into it a little bit. I like did do a mix on a tune that had TI on it. Okay. Um, which was like, I think the closest I've gotten into the hip hop world is a, just a mix engineer on a, on a tune. Um, but I know that a lot of people make these like hip hop beats and then they sell them, right? Yes. Uh, and they sell them on these websites called like Mad B 
Beats.com or whatever it's called. And- I'm 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 uh, uh, vaguely aware of those things. I mean, yeah, I, I I don't go to them, but yes. Okay, so you've never really gotten into the making type beats and selling them for thirty bucks a pop on these <laughs> sites. Uh, no, that is not a hustle I've considered. But I've also been fortunate to work with uh, uh, enough artists in 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 different way i've not had to uh sell beats for 30 bucks but yeah i've always wondered like how are these people making money if they're selling them for 30 bucks a pop it's like surely that's not their main gig right or- so i have i have one friend um uh, who i will not n- name names but he um his hustle is essentially that and so in a in a in a any given day he'll sit down in fruity loops and more or less make very subtle variations of the same it's like it'll be the same drum kit it'll be Mm. almost the exact same pattern uh you know same key but slightly different bass lines and arpeggios and stuff and you know putting together something that is i don't know maybe five six elements all together um all within styles that are working you know popular production styles and stuff so basically not just not innovating but uh, just being just copy work upon copy work upon copy work. And then uh, he sells those loops and then he, some of those loops get picked up by other bigger producers and then they use them and give them credits and stuff. And I find that Mm -hmm. to be a very interesting hustle because uh, the workflow just seems so different. Also seems kind of boring. (laughs) It seems it. Yes. I'm not, (laughs) I'm not sure to, uh, it does seem really boring. I don't think I could get much enjoyment out of that. You know, yeah, I, me either, man. I, definitely a big part of the process for me is the sound design. Uh, yeah, not so much. I mean, the beat making, yes. I always try to be like, can I like, you know, fuck with the pattern? Like, I'm always like, can it's a balancing act of like, how hard can I fuck with the pattern? Yeah, and how much will it still be understandable on the first listen to somebody on a dance floor? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. And the other thing about hip hop production is, you know, I grew up in. Uh, Minnesota and Minneapolis has a vibrant, you know, uh, uh, hip hop scene, you know, rhyme sayers is there. Um, and my friends who were beat makers who, you know, that was, uh, I had made songs and computers before, but it was using like an ASR 10 and then eventually reason 3.0. I wanted to make hip hop type beats cause I found that I found it to be so interesting, um, and so I've, I've, I've always strived to, um, to be able to make a good hip hop beat. And it was not easy at first because I did not have some of these rhythms, you know, trying to, trying to make something that actually has swagger, um, and feel, uh, but it ended up sounding kind of like, I don't know, like nursery rhymes, I guess, you know, like, do, 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 you know, try to add shuffle, <laughs> but you don't know really how to do it. Um, uh, so I still, I still. I still love that whole world. I'm actually working on a lot of hip hop beats right now, but it's more boom bath hip hop beats, not just modern 808 hip hop stuff. Right. You know? <clears throat> yeah. I tried to make a few after I watched this Netflix series about like f- people rapping where chance the rapper was like a judge or something. Okay. I was, I like, it was some like, dude, I watched so many trash Netflix series <laughs> during else, the wait. pandemic. Yeah, what else? What are you watching now? What are you and Anand watching every night? Oh, nothing. We don't. We just work constantly. Oh, boring. Yeah. Yeah, No, well, yes. (laughs) Yeah. That's all. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's very, yeah, it's kind of boring. I mean, he's just on calls all the time. And Uh, I'm just. Okay, I remember that too. He would be on Mm -hmm. calls all day and he could not relax until his inbox reached zero. His inbox never reaches zero anymore because he's uh, he has too many artists on his plate. He's right. it's just crazy. I mean, like I think about the amount of shit that my project requires to yeah. run, right? And it's just so much. Like at this point, it's like one person cannot do all the work, and he takes on a large portion of it. But then he does that for like fucking ten other artists. It's like how do yeah. you? And I understand why you're on calls all the time and just working. And like he he'll work for like. 60 dude yeah he puts in like 16 hour days and then just like sleeps four hours and like it's crazy yeah i've al- i've always admired uh um that you know i don't love the industry that is around music all the time but for people who really can pursue that type of work and do it with passion uh that's amazing because i could not be a promoter i could not 
you know, I could not just take calls uh, like that and try and work out things. I, I basically, I wouldn't, I barely wouldn't like to deal with other artist egos, you know? Um, not that I have, not that I'm an egomaniac myself, but like, uh, you know, I know that when I talk to my manager, I want him to make me feel special when we're on the call. And like, that's a small <laughs> thing, but, you know, right. just talk to me like, like, you know, <laughs> just just be excited to hear from me. And when I have an right. idea, go, wow, that sounds great. That's not that hard, but I, you know, <laughs> I need it. Ananda yeah. is your manager too, right? What's that? Is Ananda your manager also? Uh, no, he is not, but... Uh. Yeah. But he could he be. I mean, I don't know. He, yeah, uh, tell tell him what's up. We'll see. <laughs> All right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he definitely is that kind of uh, manager to some degree. I think where he's just like, oh, cool, great idea and stuff. But in a way, I think um, there's a balance, right? Like, because you can't also just be a complete yes man as a manager. Like, the, you need right. to right. say no to a lot of shit. And I think over the years, Anand has gotten better at saying no to shit. Because when we first started working together, he was just like, yeah, let's do everything. Because like, I think he wasn't used to having an artist like me who was getting so many offers uh, of like, right, and, right. And, and a lot of crazy offers too. Like I think within a year of him managing me, the Nick Cage movie thing just like randomly came into my inbox and shit like that. Oh, that's um, dope. What's the Nick Cage movie? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm behind on Bill News. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's called Mum and Dad. Um, okay. And yeah, I just like scored it, but oh, amazing! Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was it was fun, but yeah, just random shit like that. And I think because like all these offers were coming in, he was just like, "Yeah, let's do everything." And <laughs> um, and we we I was like, "No, we don't want to do shit like that." And yeah, but over the, he's gotten good now about just knowing what's good to do and what's not. Well, sometimes when you go from like, you know, you have periods where maybe there aren't a ton of offers, and then when they start coming in, you you want to say yes to everything but yeah you got to know what's manageable and and also what's going to be worth it which is you know i gotta say for someone who's been self-managed you know off and on or for a lot of my early career uh it's hard to know what's what's worth it to work on and not and there's a lot more to it other than just wanting to do the work right um you know and and, and also more than just money because there are things there are opportunities that'll come up that it's it's this constant pull of uh, culture versus commerce, you know, and you have to have a good balance of those things, I think, to feel like a good person and also to keep yourself interested. Because if you do 100% commerce and you're just finishing albums for two cycles and and whatever, I think that's boring as hell, you know. Uh, totally. That is, and that is not what I set out to do. I wanted to do interesting stuff, also, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. I think. Um my priority list for why I do something goes how much I want to do it, how fulfilling I find it, how much money it's making me, and then goes down the list with like how much anxiety is it going to cause me, how much <laughs> yeah, time is it going to take, right. like all yeah. that kind of shit. But it's yeah. like first and foremost, like how fulfilling it is and how much I want to do it, and then money. <laughs> yeah. That's like kind of the top two priorities for me. And time actually is like another big one I think of because it's like, Obviously, if it's you know, a lot of money, but it's going to take me like the next ten years of my life, I'm like, well, probably not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I've you know, speaking of offers that have come across the table, and um, you're talking about uh, scoring, uh, uh, you know, doing a film score or whatever, uh, video game soundtracks. I have done one, the Nidhogg Two soundtrack, and that was probably my favorite. I, I had never done anything like that before. Yeah, the Nidhogg 2 soundtrack. It's myself and uh you're checking it out right now. It's 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 a really it's a really fun game. Um and what was really fun about that because my a lot of my music is also informed by video games, which I've always loved video games. Video games, you know, that was the first electronic music I fell in love with and I didn't even qualify it as that when I was, you know, very young, but that you know, uh it was always there. So when the opportunity came up to do some songs for a video game, and of course I knew all the themes, you know, desert theme, water theme, jungle theme, you know, like I, and I uh, started writing to some of those things. Oh man, that was so much fun. <clears throat> I really liked doing that. Fuck yeah. Uh, it says the reviews for this game are very positive. There's 753 of them. Yeah, it's a really fun game. Actually, Eprom recently had like a game tournament with, uh, I don't know, I think it was with his friends and they did Nidhogg too. And I thought that was pretty fun. Damn, that's sick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, indie games are cool, man. I 
Have you watched that documentary? It's just called like Indie Game Developer or something. Yes, like that. yes. Actually, you know Phil Fish from that from that uh, the guy who's making Fez. Fez. Oh yeah, dude, Fez yeah. is sick. So Phil Fish, when I played the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco in like 2017, I got to play a show with Phil Fish, and it was really cool <laughs> because like I you know I meet people that are you know famous or whatever famous musicians and stuff and not to say that i'm not excited to meet some some people um but outside of that i don't get to meet people that i would like excited to meet or people who i consider celebrities but he was at this party that i played and i got a, i like asked him for a picture and all that it was pretty fun is gdc oh no i think gdc is that happens in la right um the one that i went to was in san francisco oh was it in oakland i don't remember it was in a big um it was like it was in an arena situation Huh, like Bill uh, Graham Civic Center or something? I don't know. It was all carpeted. It was like a place that was made for, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, E3 and mm. things like this or whatever. Um, but it was really cool seeing a lot of indie games there and just being in that world. It was, at the time, I remember it was uh, uh, strikingly difficult, di- difficult, strikingly different from the music world and the people that I was used to seeing. Just a different level of positivity. Um, you know, uh, it was sort of like, they, you know, a different manner of dress, a different manner of interacting. It was really fun, you know? Mm. Yeah, having just lived in SF for like two years or so, I, I know what you're talking about. The people are definitely different. Yeah, they dress different. They talk like about different shit. It's a, you, d- definitely different than interacting with music scene people. Yeah, and it was funny because like, you know, I, I I don't know the first thing about coding or what goes into making a game. I'm just you know writing, but I got to I got to have this badge that said composer on it, and I'm like I'm so <laughs> proud of that. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Uh, well, Mux, we do have to end for the day, uh, but it was really sick to have you on the podcast. Yeah, so thanks, I know, for, uh, thanks for thanks for having me. We got to be cognizant up. of your time because you go into a Blockhead show. Yes, I'm going to see Blockhead. He's also a hip hop guy, right? Or so. yes, he is very much so. He is he is. He's been a hip hop beat producer for a long time, so. Dude, I fucking yeah, I miss Denver in that way. It's it's so cool to just be able to go to a show every night of the week if you want to. It's just nice to have that possibility. It's not even that I want to go to a show every night of the week. I fucking yeah, would definitely. Go to a sh- <laughs> I, I would go to a show like maybe once a fortnight, maybe even once a month sometimes but it was it's just nice to have that possibility to be like oh yeah i could see like any one of my favorite acts this month or next month or like yeah it's constant <clears throat> i did not go to a lot of shows just before the pandemic hit uh you know i'm i'm an introvert i def- i tend to be a homebody also uh and going to shows when i'm playing shows is a little different but i was not personally all that motivated to go see shows a lot but once that ability was taken away uh I realized that it was amazing that I did have that opportunity that I could go see these shows. And so as things open back up again, I'm like, I'm going to just make the effort. I'm going to put on an outfit. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go. I can leave (laughs) as soon as I get there if I want to, but you know, I'm going to go. So, and that's this, I'm going to go, I'm going to go see a show. Nice. I'm going to hang out all night, drink water. It's going to be great. (laughs) So are you completely sober now? I'm completely sober now. Yes. And how long have you been sober? Um, you know, like three months. (laughs) oh pan- really yeah the the pandemic was not easy um gotcha. and then getting out of it was hard again you know nice yeah. well you got two months on me so you're doing oh right. okay yeah <laughs> hey we'll start up a separate thread talk about that yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah, yeah. all right man well yeah thanks a lot for for coming on man i appreciate it yeah of course anytime Yo, what's up? Thanks for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. This show is produced and edited by Robert Fumo. You can get early access to the show by going to my website, mrbillstunes.com and paying me instead of Patreon. And remember to go rate and review on iTunes or I'm going to come to your house and punch your dog in the throat, upper deck your toilet and fuck your partner. Note, I may or may not do those last couple of things. Uh, You should probably just go rate it on iTunes or Spotify or whatever it is that you listen to the podcast on because it really helps the podcast. Um, but but just know that that it'll go a long fucking way to me not doing those things if you do go do that. So uh, just just putting that out there.